Right, good afternoon. Uh, welcome all. Uh, welcome to the LSE uh, and to this event, which is part of the, uh, the LSE's fifth uh, Space for Thought Literary Festival, uh, which started on Tuesday evening and runs till Saturday evening. Uh, tickets for many events are still available to book online. <coughs> I'm, told to re I'm reading this out, but I'm just told it's true. Uh, the event is also co-sponsored by British Government at LSE, uh, which is an initiative within the school to uh, promote British government and politics more generally within the LSE. Um, today we are going to hear from Ken Livingstone, and the format of the event uh, is that we'll have a discussion here for the first um, sort of half an hour or so, 35 minutes, and then open it up for questions uh, from the audience, and of course, the uh, reason, in part, that, that Ken's here as part of a f literary festival is that he's produced his memoirs, which are on sale, on sale I'm told, outside, so well, let's not forget that. Um, but first, uh, I should say I, who I am. I'm Tony Travers from uh, British Government at LSE and the Government Department, and our guest is Ken Livingstone, who was born in South London. Uh, he joined the Labour Party in 1968, which is a very bad year indeed, and I think I've read in the past uh, Ken quoted as saying this was a rare example of a, a, a rat swimming to, was it, uh, towards the sinking towards ship. Towards the rat sw swimming towards the sinking ship, that's right, get it right. He was first elected to public office in 1971 uh, to Lambeth Council became a member of the Greater London Council in 1973 and then its leader from 1981. We can talk about all of this in a moment. He was very largely responsible for a totemic London policy, the so-called fares fare policy, a transport policy to reduce fares on public transport. And, uh, of course, that and other matters at the GLC uh, contributed to uh, Mrs Thatcher's decision and her government's decision to abolish the Greater London Council in 1986. Thereafter, Ken went on to become a Labour MP in Brent. Uh, rolling forward to 1999, new Labour government, Mayor of London, office created, though I think, actually, Ken, you were Apparently, against the idea yeah. when it was in committee in the House of Commons. Uh, and uh, Ken Livingstone, at that point... Uh, was uh, not selected as the Labour candidate. I think it's fair to say this was after a process described by Steve Norris, the Conservative candidate, as worthy of North Korea. Uh, apologies to anybody from North Korea in the audience. And uh, subsequently, as we know, became a mayor as an independent and uh, then served two terms as mayor, instituting a number of policies, some of them to do with transport as before, but of course perhaps most notably the one that uh, we will all think of first, the congestion charge, which is almost exactly 10 years ago to, what well, is 10 years ago to this month. Um, there's no question that Ken Livingstone is seen as a left-wing politician, often known both disparagingly and lovingly as Red Ken. Um, and has a, a number of interests outside politics, most of which are, I think it's fair to say, to do with gardening and uh, zoology, and indeed London mm. Zoo itself. Uh, his memoirs, recently published, are called You Can't Say That, uh, though he did once author a book called If, you, if, if Voting Changed Anything, They'd Abolish It. Uh, so you can see where we're going to go in a moment. Anyway, uh, he was reconciled with the Labour Party in 2004, stood, as I said, as mayor twice, won twice, lost uh, in 2008 to Boris Johnson, and subsequently has gone back into the Labour, to the Labour Party's non, uh, National Executive Committee, I think it's right to say, and has a continuing active role in urban politics in Britain and overseas. So uh, that's just by way of a, a, a biographical introduction. But what I'd like to do by way of uh, uh, just talking for a few minutes now, Ken, is to, I mean, to look back to the London of your childhood, London of the 1950s. 1950s is a time which I think is hugely important for British politics. For some people it's seen as a, a golden age when there was prosperity, people lived together in a rather more easy way than they do today, but for others it's seen as a sort of slightly repressive time, a time when social attitudes were harsh mm. and the world was not as good as it sometimes 
uh, described. I mean, growing well, up as a boy in South London, what, what, did, what, with the benefit of hindsight, did South London we, feel like then? Well, very quiet. Um, I, and even I can recall coming up to the West End, going out with friends in the mid-1960s, and you could walk through Leicester Square at about 9 o'clock at night, you'd be empty. I, my mum, who'd been a, a dancer on the stage in the 30s, I, she always bemoaned the fact that London was alive in those days, and it never come back to life. Mm. Um, after the Second World War, people went to bed relatively early. Um, but we didn't think we were hard done by, because we were the luckiest generation. I mean, our parents, who'd really had to struggle for everything, we, although, I mean, in retrospect, it, you know, things weren't lavish, they were better than any working-class generation ever had before. So we didn't grow up feeling we were being, you know, as a problem. It was just complete... All the things that helped to define London now just really weren't there. There were small enclaves of Chinese and, and black people and so on, but it was a very uniformly white city, a very intolerant of homosexuality, and really there was no sex. I mean, it, I mean... I, I, you know, I, I started secondary school completely unaware, you know, anything to do with sex. I mean, it's only when the biology classes started when I was 13. Um, and it's hard to remember this now, but, you know, it, there was a book came out in 65, Johnson and Masters, Human Sexual Response. First really serious bit of work about human sexual response. And that demolished the broadly accepted idea at the time in amongst the medical fraternity, that it wasn't possible for a woman to have an orgasm unless a man was inside her. Now, that's the world I grew up in. You know, it was pretty repressive. Mm. And then we all went mad. Along came the 70s. <laughs> and... You missed out the 60s, actually. Though. Well, the 60s, there was, there was a small group of people going mad, and the rest of us all watching, okay, yeah, right. basically. <laughs> um, anyway, there was, you know, the Rolling Stones and all that. A small leap. It didn't really... St- catch on for the masses. Um, and I mean, my, I mean, my parents... I mean, literally, if I recall, I was the only one of my group of friends. I mean, well, when I started work at the age of 17 at the Royal Mars as a technician, all the other junior technicians, all in their teens, about eight or nine of us, we were all virgins. Almost all of them, the first time they had sex, it was with the woman they were going to marry. Mm. You know? I was the only one that didn't, wasn't married and with kids by the time they were about 21. It was just a very different world. And your parents, living in... Were they born in South London? No, my dad um, grew up in the Argentine, no. which, fortunately, Thatcher never discovered about, otherwise it made my life more difficult. <laughs> <laughs> He'd been, he was born in Scotland, but literally then on a boat. I, so first 13 years of life growing up there, and then he came to where the family had originally from in Dunoon. And his mum died. His father walked away and said, good luck, son, and never saw him again. So he, he joined the Merchant Navy and, and was sailing around the world. My mum, her father was killed in the First World War. She never saw him or um, remembers him. And so they, she grew up fairly hard times. And, but but my political? grandmother wanted political? her to be a dancer. Were they, she, she want the, they wanted they were, Political? Quite. They were members of the... I mean, they were working-class Tories. I, my uncle, who had dual membership of Oswald Mosley's Black Shirts and the Tory party, I, <laughs> was very active in the Streatham Conservative Association, and he, wor- he was, he, he was trundling around selling cloth. He worked for the local LCC member, whose name I forget. And I, my earliest political memory, about the age of three is my dad writing a letter to the South London Press complaining that Duncan Sands had been parachuted in and pushed aside uh, for the parliamentary nomination and uh, the local guy that had worked so hard. Which is bad news for Streatham because the bugger only ever turned up once every five years. He was driven during the last Saturday of the election. You know, he was driven on a jeep through Streatham waving at people. That's all they ever saw of him. And <laughs> you lived in South London mm-hmm. and... Uh, went to school in mm. South London and joined the Labour Party in South mm. London at pretty well the, the absolute nadir mm. of its 60s unpopularity. I mean, what, what was it about 
the Labour Party's worst year in mm. modern times that attracted you, I mean, that made you attracted <laughs> to the Labour Party? Well, I mean, I almost joined in 68. I mean, in the end, I put it off to 69. I was about to join when Labour rushed through the emergency legislation banning Kenyan Asians from exercising their right to come here as the Kenyatta government started to crack. That was so offensive, I just couldn't bring myself to do it. But then people I'd met while I was hitchhiking in Africa who were draft resistors from the Vietnam War in the States, I got involved in a campaign to you know, get them into Britain. And I got involved with my local Labour MP. And I was really lucky. In Nord Labour Party, we had a John Fraser, good, decent, very open-minded MP, a very much ahead of his time in thinking about issues of race and sex, um, and a brilliant... I mean, we had a Labour agent who was actually in favour of encouraging people to join, whereas most Labour agents you know, were keeping people out in case they caused trouble. Um, so I, I was just very lucky. I, 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 I happened to be living here where there's a good local Labour party left of centre, um, and I literally... I'd been totally caught up watching the events of 1968 in Chicago and in um, Prague and, and uh, France. And I realised by the end of that that you weren't going to achieve political change through street protest. And I decided, like Daniel Convendit wrote up at some point, we need to work our way through the institutions and achieve change like that. When I first met John Ross, who was in the International Marxist Group, and he came to work with me when I became an MP, I said to him, look, I'm a reformist, I'm not a revolutionary, I'm, I, but I always want to achieve the maximum reform, I mean, not wait to see what I might be pushed into. And when you joined the Labour Party, I mean, I think I've, 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 yeah, I've mm. so, heard you say before that one of the people in the Conservative administration in Lambeth mm. Uh, at this point was John Major, yeah. went on to be Prime Minister, and that he was a force for good in Lambeth Council, that is, <coughs> the sorting out some of the more dismal attitudes of Labour in power, had had in power before, is that right? It was a classic old Labour Council. I think it had gone Labour in about 34, and had been Labour right up until 68. And, I mean, each year, the housing crisis was a nightmare in Lambeth. A, and the, the Labour group, run by some real old Labour machine people, Alderman Cotton and Alderman Calder, each year they decide how many homes they could build, depending on how much they could increase the rate. They, they approach it, well, you know, defined by the rate, and then see what we can do, rather than this is what we have to do. And the Tories won, a, without any great radical plan, and there was Bernard Perkins was leader, um, and they just looked at how bad the thing was and decided to sort of massively expand house building, a, something we'd all been desperately hoping a Labour council would do. Then along came, there were about, it was one of those amazing situations. Labour had gone from a huge majority to three seats out of 60. And on the, the night in 68 when they won, one of the Conservatives who'd been elected in Vauxhall demanded a recount because he couldn't, you know, you know he Didn't couldn't find the time to yeah. do the job. And so an awful lot of people got in who'd never been expecting. There's a group of about eight, right, you know, Kent on, get, their line was, we've got to send all the blacks home, completely openly racist. And, you know, Perkins and Major expelled them from the Tory group. So there's right. no place for you in the Tory party. So, I mean, it was very embarrassing to see a Tory administration more liberal-minded and decent than the old Labour one. <laughs> And then in 1973, you were elected mm. to the GLC for the first time. And again, your, book, your, your memoirs and elsewhere I know you've mm. written, clear that you found the controlling group on the Labour group mm. at County Hall very old-fashioned, very stuck in the mud. Mm. Is that fair? Yeah. I, because Labour had been almost wiped out in the 67 GLC election, I... <laughs> They ended up having a leader, Reg Goodwin, who I mean, had no sense of leadership at all. You know, he could have chaired the meetings, but I mean, he wasn't an unpleasant person, but you, you just, there was never any feedback from him. I mean, he just was drifted along. 
we, we got elected with a very radical manifesto. I mean, literally, a commitment, and this was at a time when Bob Mellish was the chair of the London Labour Party. This manifesto was that we municipalise all private rented housing, massively increase the house building programme, and cut fares as a first stage to abolition affairs. Yes. Much more radical than I won on in 1981. And, of course, then four months later was the Yom Kippur War. I had the oil prices surged, and it came at the point where the GLC was refunding the debts they'd incurred to build housing in the post-war period. So th th these, this housing programme, which had been you know, based on 2 and 3% interest rates, happened to refund at 10% or whatever, and then the budget collapsed. It was what made me a monetarist. I mean, Ed Balls often jokes and says, you're really a Friedmanite. But I mean, if you went through a situation where your entire program was savage because of the scale of the debt you'd accumulated, it, I mean, it was a very valuable lesson. And the way you describe both getting involved in Lambeth mm. politics, then the GLC Labour mm. Group, is of going in to change it. Mm. Not a revolutionary, but you wanted to change mm. it. Now, of course, this is at a time when the Labour Party more generally with the benefit of hindsight from some of its leaders, was seen as the <coughs> victim or beneficiary, depending on how you look at it, of entryism. Mm. I mean, did you see yourself, just aiming off for the very pejorative use of the word entryism, did you, did you see yourself as getting in there to change it, part of a group of younger people who wanted to change the Labour Party? Yes, but as somebody who wanted to run things, whereas most of the people coming in into groups like militant and other left-wing groups were coming in waiting for the revolution. I, mean, I didn't think that was going to happen. I thought, you get in there and you push all this old guard out and have people come along who actually want to run things, initiate um, new ideas and so on. I mean, when we won Lambeth in 71, I mean, we had commitments to introduce free travel on the buses for pensioners, free contraception. I mean, and I fell in love with being on the GLC in Lambeth in those days, because you had quite a freedom to do things, initiate new policies. Mm -hmm. um, and I, did, I mean, if you've been interviewing me then, I said, I wouldn't want to go to Parliament. I want to spend my entire life in London local government. You could achieve so much. You could actually get... I, I got an adventure playground built on this state I'd grown up on, things like that. You could do so much. I mean, you, you talk to poor borough councillors now, it's just this thing. You had 15 years of... Well, a decade of retrenchment, really. So there you are, you're, you're on the GLC um, in the 1970s. The Conservatives won in 1977, a relatively radical Conservative leader and mm. Conservative group, and then you're back in, op <coughs> your party's in opposition. If we roll forward to the 1981 uh, GLC mm. election, your Conservative, or sorry, the Conservative leader mm. said at the time, if Labour wins, there'll be a revolution that Andrew McIntosh, the moderate leader, will be pushed out of power and a leftist uh, administration will uh, get into power. Labour did just win that election and indeed exactly that takeover took place within 24 hours. Could you um, well, describe how that, how that came, why Sir Horace Cutler was right? I was lucky in the sense that every other left-winger on the GLC lost their seats in the 77 election. I mean, had Tony Banks hung on in Feltham, he would have been the left candidate for leader. Mm. I was the left candidate for leader because there was nobody else on the left, you know. Um, and I immersed myself in, you know, drawing up all the... We were determined to draw up a manifesto that wouldn't implode like the 73 one. There was a lot of activity around all that. And Andrew Mac... Well, Reg Goodwin's strategy initially had been to hang on until after the 81 election and stand down, and his preferred successor was Tony Judge. I, it was another uh, honest right-winger. Right -winger. Right -winger. Uh, but also, a much, he would have been a much more effective leader. Andrew had no political skills. Uh, he, having be he beat me by one vote the year before the election. And in the year that followed, he didn't bother to work a relationship with Ilted, the deputy leader, or Harvey, the chief whip. Within three months of him becoming leader... They were working with me to get rid of him, I, because... In the run-up to the election? In, yeah, because... So, so Horace Cutler was right, you were, oh, we, you we, were we, always... We are planning it all the way through, right. yes. Yeah, I, okay. <laughs> but it was hardly a secret, was it? I mean, the papers were all filled with it, screaming headlines. Um, I remember 
On the, it's quite interesting, though. I met Roy Jenkins about well, 15 years ago, and he, he said to me, I thought what you did to Andrew McIntosh, at the time I thought it was terrible, but now I've had to deal with him in the House of Lords, I understand why you did it. <laughs> he, because Andrew, had, he was a good like, small businessman, he was a good academic, he had none of the sort of the rather sordid skills you need if you go lead a group of politicos, some of whom are mad, some of whom are pretty dim. I mean, it's, you know, he had none of those skills. But, I mean, my, my favourite is that night, Mrs. Satcher's response was, she was addressing the Scottish Conservatives, and she said, I mean, what has happened in London? I mean, it's terrible. I mean, they seek to impose on the people of London the sort of tyranny the people of Eastern Europe wish to escape from. And when we cut the fares, the Daily Mail said this is the first step to a full Soviet economy. It's <laughs> hard to believe now, but policy... Don't forget, that was the point at which there was a genuine fear of a nuclear war. A, Reagan was in office, there was a huge expansion of armaments, incredible tensions. I mean, we now know that around Andropov, the um, Soviet leader, there was a real fear that America would have a sneak attack. Yeah. And so the intensity, the ideological debate, and if you weren't 100% behind Thatcher and Reagan, you were basically a traitor. But, but in that sense, there you are. You're in, in, mm. ensconced now in County Hall. Mm. Uh, you've got a banner on the building mm. saying the number of people unemployed mm. in London. Mrs. Thatcher, you know it's aggravating Mrs. Thatcher mm. over in her fortress on the other side. Mm. The way you just talked about Mrs. Thatcher suggests that you needed her and that she needed you. Ah, that, no, that she didn't you, need me. No, you're not, I mean, that you, but for each other you defined mm. something sign, that made it possible to, to mm. rally the troops in opposition mm. to something. You for well, her, her for you. You'd had two periods of Labour government in the 60s and 70s that had both failed to deliver. A, the Labour Party seemed completely adrift in opposition. Michael Foote, who was an absolutely lovely man, but I mean, completely hopeless in that role. And I hadn't anticipated that massive coverage we were going to get. I mean, before I became leader of the GLC, there'd be the very occasional story, you know. And suddenly it was wall to wall, and everything we did and said. I mean, the Sun had a whole team of reporters digging into every aspect of my private life. Um, and it was like being knocked over by a media wall, and incredibly damaging. By that October, my poll rating was down to 18%. And then along came the judges who overturned our fares policy, which was something people... I mean, ridership on bus and tube went up by about, I think, 20% in a week. I, something, I mean, cutting the fares a third really made a difference to people in a grim old recession. And there was quite a lot of spare capacity at the time on the tube. And, you know... Then you know, the campaign against judges. I didn't write it. Danny Boyle got arrested. I mean, it was his first demonstration protesting against the, the, the law lord's decision. I mean, I mean, but people really were galvanised. And there was this defining moment. I, the very first meeting of our campaign against the judge's decision was in Hornchurch. Hornchurch has had the biggest swing to Thatcher anywhere in Britain. It was a seat we'd lost massively. I turned up there, and it was wall-to-wall -wall people, um, and overwhelmingly support. And these were ordinary local people in Hornchurch. I mean, not my natural supporters. And from then on, it was a slow progression upwards, you know. And I think as we got more popular, that's when Thatcher got why she, she wouldn't have bodish, bothered to abolish it if we were going to lose the GLC election. Come on to abolition, mm. but I mean, in addition to the transport policies... Mm you also pursued what were in those days called equalities policies, mm. um, uh, still called equalities, but differently formed perhaps then. So you were extremely uh, aggressive in pushing women's issues, uh, gay and lesbian equality, uh, race equality, and other analogous issues, mm. to the point where it was seen as problematic for the Labour Party Nationally, now, Do you feel but, that you were wrong then or just everybody else was running behind you? I think, I mean, if we'd had an idea of the media firewall that was coming, we might have structured them separately rather than starting them all off at once. Um, but with the passage of time, these are all now mainstream. I mean, we launched a campaign to change the law, two laws, 
One, genital mutilation, which was legal in Britain at that stage. Women were being genitally mutilated by surgeons, um, quite lawful. And also rape in marriage. A, it, were, it was not... It, you could, a woman could not accuse her husband of rape. I mean, we've come so far now, you, you look back and think, you know, we were just a bit out of our time, but then at the average age of the GLC group had been about halved. I mean, it was suddenly filled with people, I mean, their 30s and, and 20s, and who'd grown up, you know, in a, with a very different attitude to the old Labour Party. And the old Labour, I mean, I remember Roy Jenkins, um, apart from Roy Jenkins, I mean, very few people in the leadership of the Labour Party took a stand on those sort of liberal issues. Um, as he'd done on homosexual law reform and abolishing hanging. Um, and I mean, Roy Hattersley once said to me, you have no idea how offensive all those things you were doing were in my local working men's club. But this was what was wrong with the old Labour Party, you know? Yeah. It was deeply reactionary on these sort of issues. But they still nevertheless thought, and I think some mm. of them still do, that you and other politicians like you at the time were making the Labour Party unelectable. I mean, uh, and it did, I mean, there's no question what? that senior Labour figures mm. to this day no, no. think that what you did then in this, these policies what? made Labour unelectable. What made Labour unelectable was two failed periods of government in the 60s and 70s, where they promised so much and delivered so little. And then Mrs Thatcher having the good luck to come mm. along just as the oil started to flow. Without the oil, I'm not certain she would have got her three terms at all. I mean, she had a financial cushion that meant she could afford to pay for you know, the trebling of unemployment and, and things like that. I, you know, it, it's economics that determine the outcomes of things overwhelmingly. Do you remember where you were and what you were doing when you heard that Mrs Thatcher's government had decided to abolish the Greater London Council? I think because they'd had a cabinet meeting where the idea had been floated and it had been overwhelmingly rejected. And Tom King was on a... Because it was the 83 election, at the beginning of the 83 election. He was the Environment Secretary. Yeah, he was on a... He got off his train to where he was going to do an election meeting and was told Mrs. Satter had decided we were going to put it in the manifesto. Um, and I most shortly picked it up about that time. I can't really remember. Um, but we threw our... So I mean, I just, but it was a turning point, wasn't it? Because it made... That really did make mm. you popular. You'd been unpopular mm. up before then, but despite the popularity yeah. of the transport mm. policy, the other ones had made you... But this issue made you, in effect, into a victim, well, and it allowed you to turn the tables on Mrs Thatcher. I mean, Thatcher had done the polling. Even in 1983, when she came up with the idea, it was rejected by about two to one by the majority of Londoners. I mean, I mean whatever disagreements people might have had, with my administration. I mean, I did think there should be something there to run London. And you triggered a by-election on the issue. Yeah. We got, a bit like David Davis did a few years ago, a, four of us stood down, which meant had we lost, and all in marginal seats, the Tories would have taken control. And the Tories just took the decision not to stand. So I ended up with 80% of the vote on about 30% turnout. Right. I, <laughs> And I remember when David Davis announced he was standing <coughs> to fight a by-election, standing down, I told him this, oh, for God's sake, don't remind anyone of that, you see. And of course, Labour didn't stand against him either. Yeah. Cowardice is, I think, the term we're looking for in this. GLC was abolished in 1986, mm. and you then decided <coughs> to go into Parliament, stood for Parliament, got elected as an MP, were then in Parliament all the way through till you became Mayor, and we'll come on to that in a moment, in 2000. I mean, it's widely assumed, and I think it comes out in what you've written, that you're not, you weren't, Parliament wasn't your fav oh, favourite place. Is that and fair? it still is awful. I, <laughs> I like doing things around here. I mean, and I think my mindset doesn't fit well with politics because when I dropped out of school, that eight years I did at the Royal Marsden, I mean, the cancer unit, I was working with brilliant doctors, one of whom discovered cure for testicular cancer. And so that formative eight years, I, I was with people who, for whom pursuing the truth and demonstrating it were the key. Then I shift to politics, where so what can we afford to say? And that's why, I mean, that, had, that you know, the, the title of the book, You Can't Say That, politics is filled with people who have been saying to me, you can't say that. And I say, but it's true. 
And they would come back and say, but that doesn't matter. You know, I just found this offensive. And it, as well in Parliament, I, in the first two years, I was throwing myself into it because I, the plan was that when Kinnock lost the next election, I would stand for the leadership of select candidate. And I didn't know much about economics at all. And so I spent that first two years getting on top of economic policy because I think that's crucial. And it's why Labour governments have failed. I mean, they would, it's, Labour governments are filled with people who want to talk about human rights, foreign aid, house building. They hope someone else will sort out the economy, you know. Um, and so I was quite enthusiastic and doing a lot. But then I was voted off the NEC, which was the first sign, this was in 89, that the Labour Party membership, because it was a membership, not the one looking at plot, the membership were drifting to the right and losing their confidence at radical left politics. And then over the next three years, Skinner was kicked off, Ben was kicked off, and it opened the way to the, the abomination. <laughs> What do you mean by the abomination? New Labour. Oh, right. New Labour. Okay. Just thought I'd maybe say it on the record. It's been filmed. Just thought I'd... So, there you are. Not liking Parliament. Labour wins in 1997. Mm. And the, immediately, they campaigned on the idea of a directly elected mayor mm. for London, which you, in Parliament, opposed. Mm. Now, given that you are, by common consent, you weren't in, in the clubbable atmosphere of Parliament, wasn't for you. Mm. Whereas... The, as it turned out, the office of directly elected mayor, you as an individualist, as an individual, was attractive to you. Why did you oppose it when the idea came up in Parliament? For, for all the reasons that played out, it's personality politics. I, and it allows... So that plays to your strengths. Yeah, but I didn't want... I mean, don't get... I, I achieved as much leading the GLC Labour Group as I did as directly elected mayor. It's... Very nice being a director to me. You make a decision and nobody else gets a say in all of it. But I don't actually think that's a good idea. I mean, so you, I, would you get rid of the office of Mayor of London I'd, I, If it was up to me, I'd say no. We, we move to a, an elected council and the councillors will decide who their leader is. Because the interesting thing is Boris has used it to promote himself very effectively. I mean, but if you talk to the Tory members of the Assembly, they really aren't happy. And if they had a capacity to remove him, he'd be much more attentive rather than just promoting himself. Um, and that's a check on bad leaders. I mean, I'm, the line I used when Blair was pushing this was that any one time in America, at least 50 mayors were in prison for corruption. And the directly elected executive has a capacity for that. I took a decision on who got the contract to operate um, the congestion charge. I mean, I could easily have opened a channel to the company bidding to say, well, we, we look for some I mean, help on this. A donation would be useful. I, when I was mayor, the mayor had the ability to direct the refusal of major planning application. So you were in regular contact with major property developers. I mean, now, even more dangerous, I, the mayor has the power to o overturn a local council's refusal and direct acceptance. Now, there is nothing to stop a meeting between the mayor, as happens a lot in America and part, other parts of the world, a mayor who is the elected executive can meet the developer, and what deal do you do with no one there to check? And you've got, you know, your numbered Swiss bank account into which money suddenly appears. The potential for corruption is enormous. When you were at City Hall, at the count, uh, County Hall, after you'd mm. you know, been re-elected... And of course, I've suddenly moved past the point where it's worth just pausing for a second about uh, why do you think that uh, Tony Blair and Gordon Brown were so um, desperate to stop you becoming Labour's candidate for mayor? I think they just assumed I'd do to them what I'd done to Thatcher I, and make their life very difficult and so on. Um, I think as well, I mean, in that guide, parliamentary guide, I can't remember, was it Jonathan Roth, parliamentary guides? He talks about Gordon Brown's visceral loathing of London, in particular the London left. Um, Tony Blair, it was more, he didn't have a clue what it was all about. Andrew really. Roth. Andrew Roth, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and therefore, they didn't really know much about me. I'd actually, about t ten weeks before Blair won the 97 election, 
I decided I would rather be part of his administration and try and help push it in the right direction. So I went and saw him and said that. And we had a very friendly conversation. And then he, he didn't have space to give me a job initially. But he invited me back to see him in October after he'd won the election. And by that stage, it was quite clear to me, everything was just run from this, you know, Blair, Brown, Mandelson, Campbell, Cleek, and nobody else had any say at all. Mm. And I remember Blair saying, like, no, how do you think it's going? I said, much worse than I expected. And, that, <laughs> yeah. and I told him what I thought, and, and it's so... But I wasn't going to tell him I thought he was doing I thought he was doing disastrously badly. I told him, push through change rapidly and quickly. And his line was, we'll, do, we'll be very restrained in our first term, and then we'll be able to do so much more in our second. And nothing like that happens in politics. The longer you're there, the more your support is eroded, the more things drag you down. Bang it all through right at the beginning. Yeah. OK, well, when you did become there, against their best, uh, despite their best mm-hmm. efforts... Well, they're pretty crappy efforts. Thing. Well, no. I said they're best, would, I did their best I would have efforts. paid them to be as stupid as they were. If well, they'd ignored them. <laughs> I mean, the, I tell the classic thing. Every time there was a newspaper story about I was running, there'd be a quote from a, a Labour Party source or Downing Street source saying, but he won't be allowed to. And they'd, they didn't realise the drip, drip, drip of that. London is reading this thing, well, I mean, shouldn't it be up to us to decide not some faceless bureaucrat. I mean, and that's they were Steve mad. Norris was right, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, yeah. Well, don't you? Know, we, they rigged the electoral college so that members had a vote, trade unions had a vote, and MPs had a vote. But the MPs' votes were a thousand times an ordinary member. If you actually look at votes cast, I got 74,000 to Frank Dobson's 24,000, mm. and he was declared the winner. So it was very North Korea. Excellent. Yeah. Well, when, you're, when you are in office at City Hall, the policies you... Uh, adopt there towards growth, towards the mm. economy, are very different to the ones a few years, mm. not that many years mm. before, at County Hall. At County Hall, you'd had a, a, an economic policy that, to all intents and purposes, wanted to... Rebuild industry. To, mm. Well, to protect the mm. existing industrial base. Mm. And by the time you arrive at City Hall, mm. um, you're into, effectively, going for growth, banking, mm. financial services very much going with the grain of Mrs mm. Thatcher's world, you might argue. Mm. So did you become, in part, a convert to neoliberalism? No. I, I'm a monetarist in the sense that I, I, don't, I think you should only really borrow for investment in infrastructure or in the, you know, the pit of a recession. But, I mean, that pre... pre you know, we were about... We wanted investment in not just preserving our old industries like Kodak up at Harrow. But we came up in 83 with a proposal whilst Thatcher was... It was a debate about, shall we get our television via cable or satellite? And Jeff Mulgan was the secretary of this group in, in our industry unit and recommended we have the whole of Britain linked up in a fibre-optic cable system. Now, we would have been ahead, I mean... Google, Apple, could all have been things devised here. So we weren't just about defending the old industry, we really wanted to build new ones. By the time I became mayor, the powers of mayor, within City Hall, the mayor was the absolute god, and once a year the assembly could try and change the budget, the rest of it, the mayor ran it all. But the actual powers were so much more limited than the GLC had had. So I would have liked to have had a major industrial strategy, and we did try and promote a lot of stuff about new greens and all that. But the best I could do was what I could leave out out of a major property development. I mean, it wasn't the world I would have chosen, but it's the world you're in. You get, do the best you can with it. So but you were, by then, very much, though, for whatever reasons, mm. pursuing you know, a sort of... What looks to, you well, have to if, describe it as yeah. neoliberal-ish. You'd have to but if a bank that. is deciding whether to go to New York or London, the mayor's job is to try and get them to come to London. I would also like to have done a lot of other things and rebalance our economy. And if, if, for those of you who are interested, I mean, back in 1990, I started publishing a thing called Socialist Economic Bulletin. You go on the website, they're all there. If you really want... in the LSE library, for sure. It's oh, yeah. I mean, go yeah. back and read them. I mean, right the way through, we were... And this is my economics advisor, John Ross, doing most of the work on it. We were advocating a high investment strategy 
because, I mean, the conclusion we came to was that the biggest single factor in economic success is the level of investment. And the best year we ever had was 20% in 1973 for the oil crisis. But West Germany was 25%. Now we're down, the last figure I saw, we're about 13.9. China's 46%. And it's not like you've done your investment, you don't have to do very much more. In a world where there's more and more competition, more and more things high-tech, you actually have to increase the level of investment. The, the same problem is besetting America. And then finally, then we'll, well, then we'll open this up. Just roll forward to 2008 and then again 2012. Mm. Having been mayor for two terms, um, set up the system at City Hall, mm. created the office of mayor, really. Um, you lost to Boris Johnson in 2008 mm. and then stood again and lost uh, last year. I mean... Aiming off the fact that Labour was unpopular, mm. certainly in the first of those occasions, mm. what, what was it about losing that you think was down to something other than Labour's unpopularity in 2008? Oh, there's... You had... Oh, well, I mean, we didn't realise at the time we'd just gone into recession. Five weeks before polling day, we had the 10p tax fiasco which whilst a lot of judges are now saying a 10p tax plan doesn't make a great deal of difference, it did mean the very poorest people hanging on in jobs suddenly got clobbered with higher taxes. That was lethal. And I ran 13% ahead of the Labour vote, but it just wasn't enough to overcome. I, Boris has also got you know, his popularity. You'd also had the Evening Standard campaign. And if you do read my autobiography, I included all the worst things journalists have ever said about me in there, because it's really... Quite amazing. Um, you'd had six months of a campaign saying I was at the centre of corruption of network and uh, network corruption and cronyism, um, and that must have been damaging as well. In the same way, this time I was at the centre of some international tax fraud ring. Um, I prefer the days when we actually argued boringly about policy rather than now elections are all about smears and personality. I'm afraid. Okay. Well, let's see where the audience wants to go for policies or smears. Um, <laughs> Would anybody like to ask, try and keep, keep questions relatively short, would anybody like to ask anything or say something? Keep it nice and short so we get plenty. The gentleman there in a purplish sweater. In retrospect, having you said you... say who you are if you want to. Don't you have Jonathan to. Jonathan Silver. In retrospect, Ken, when you said that you wouldn't stand against a uh, Labour Party mayor or candidate first time around, how do you feel about standing now? Um, you mean in 2016 or in any Labour candidate well, anywhere? I mean, I, I'm very tribal about it. I was so angry when the SDP people defected from Labour, furiously angry with them. And it was really a series of just events pushed me into it. And there was a, suddenly a point where I thought, no, screw it. I, I am going to stand against them. It's, I'm going to give people the first chance they're going to get to put two fingers up to Tony Blair, basically, because this is wrong. It was scandalous. I mean, and it isn't just what they did in rigging my selection. I mean, the new Labour machine started weeding out people they didn't agree with politically. Instead of local parties being able to select who they wanted, people were parachuted in. Um, they went through a cull of local councillors, for God's sake. People who'd been on the council for years were told they didn't have the life skills and their CV wasn't sufficiently good. And what it meant was, it wasn't just purging left-wingers. Mainly what happened was a large shift away from working-class representation on London boroughs. And so now I think this is wrong. I mean, in that brief period when the left controlled the London Labour Party executive, a, some on the left said, we should stop right-wingers being on the panel of candidates. And myself and Ted Knight said, absolutely not. I mean, that's been used against us so often in the past. Let local parties choose who they want. At heart, I believe in that. I mean, I'd be in favour of primary elections, just as long as you can guarantee fair media coverage. You, know? you mean open primaries or part within party primaries? Well, I, mean I could live with primaries. either, but, I mean, there are some people saying Labour should select its candidate for mayor in 2016 with an open primary, any Londoner having a right to vote. Well, apart from the cost of running it, why not just say to the editor of the Evening Standard, tell us who you want? Because <laughs> hey, 
they will throw their weight behind who their preferred candidate is and God help the rest of them, you know. <laughs> but I will be 71 next time, nearly. I'll be about a month off 71. I, I don't have any instinct to stand. That's not quite no. Wait. And <laughs> <laughs> let me say no. I mean, it's the same reason some people say to me, you should stand for Parliament at the next general election, but I'll be just off 70 at that stage. And my wife's gone off to, to uni because she wants to be a teacher, so I'm the house husband. I'm quite enjoying it. I'm seeing my kids, you know. I did my life the wrong way round. My first kid was when I was 44. Um, and I was just always at meetings, you know. OK, now, um, <coughs> should a question there. I see a hand. Uh, yes, you with a hand. Oh, sorry, obviously. Oh, well, and then behind you, sorry. Hello. I have two people with hands. Sandra Chevy, I... I just want to say thank you for an amazing career, and it's made all of us who have always loved, who love, have loved London for years, love it even more when you were, when you were active and doing wonderful mm. things for the city. Um, I did want to mention one name, Bob Kiley, ah. because I think that might be the one sort of Achilles' heel in your career. Oh no! So why do you say that? Well, because, because you, didn't you give him a huge amount of money to come mm. over and try and sort out transport? He got a house in Mayfair. He got a mm. couple of million. Oh. I mean, the guy is an idiot. No, no. I mean, I could do better. Bob, Bob, Bob was brilliant. I, he he explained to I, not everybody will know. Bob Kiley had he he'd been the the equivalent of the president of the National Students Union of America. He'd been recruited into the CIA. He ended up as the personal assistant to the director of the CIA, Richard Helms, the one that went to prison or was convicted, but didn't go to prison. Um, he then went to work in Boston, and working with a guy called David Gunn, turned around, modernised the Boston Underground. Then he came and did the same thing in New York. And his, you know, when we were looking for someone to run um, Transport for London, his CV was just breathtaking. Um, by that stage, he was the head of... I mean, he was effectively like leading the Chamber of Commerce in New York... He was on about half a million pounds a year. And I said to him, look, I, we can't pay you any more because you'll be the highest paid civil servant in Britain already. But we don't expect you to take a pay cut. Old enough now. I mean, I mean those salaries got even I mean, worse than that. Did you ask him for his plan before you paid him? He had a brilliant plan. I mean, and one of the things was... Back, uh, dumping, uh, you know, 15 pensioners because they're, they're, they're ahead of time or they're over time and then they turn oh, no, around because of this the, or that. The bus service is, the, the, I mean, a dram um, dramatic turnaround. I think it's a 50% increase in ridership. We went from 5,500 clapped out old buses. And because people had to pay as they get on, I mean, they were very slow. I mean, the, the bus service has been totally transformed, and he was there I mean, at the heart of all that. But the thing I most wanted, because at this stage, Gordon Brown was pursuing this balmy idea of the par par public-private partnership on the underground, nightmarishly complex and very expensive. And I was hoping that by demonstrating we brought... Because Brown and Blair were in love with all things American, bringing this, what was the standard called, hard man from New York, who modernise the underground there, we could persuade them, let Kylie get on, David. I mean, if we had persuaded the government to drop the PPP, David Gunn was going to come and actually oversee the modernisation. But he said to me, look, if the PPP goes through, you need a lawyer, not a, a train engineer. The one thing they did in New York was they air-conditioned the underground. Yeah. That's the one thing they should be doing over here on the okay. buses, particularly. Well, let's, let's, you know, let's, 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 yeah. leave, let's leave the underground the PPP <laughs> for now. We may visit it again, but thank you for that. Gentleman further back. Thanks. Um, hi, Max. I'm a grad student here at LSE. Out of the current lot of Tories, um, who's your favourite one and why? <laughs> <laughs> Out of the current lot of Tories? I mean, well... If you think I've got contempt for them, you should hear what Conservative MPs uh, are saying about their leadership. Uh, it's, and the old Thatcherites. I mean, uh, uh, so you're saying you like them more than all of those, are you? Well, the, the, only, I mean, the only one I'd want to spend time with socially is Ken Clark, which I have occasionally done. He was much the most effective chance that the Tories have thrown up. If Cameron wants to have any chance of winning the next election, he should, you know, 
publicly eviscerate Osborne and put Ken Clark in. The trouble is, Ken Clark is now so out of touch with the majority thinking on the Tory backbenches. They, it isn't as obvious, but effectively, they, they, they become like a British version of the Tea Party movement. They're all barking mad. You know. <laughs> they, we've just seen the implosion of 30 years of the neoliberal experiment in, in Britain and America. And broadly, also, we just didn't do it rigorously enough. You know. um, the, 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 I think there is a turning point in politics. Someone like Ken Clark could seize that, but they're never going to do that. What do you think of David Cameron then? I mean, Cameron is surely, isn't he at some level an inheritor? His attempt to change the Conservative Party's image on social issues. No, no, it's going back to the kind of things that we were talking about that you were doing at the GLC in the 80s. He's now trying to retrofit some of that into... He's trying to modernise the Tory party, but I have to say, I think, in a very crowded field, he is the most dishonest Prime Minister of my lifetime. (laughs) I I mean, politicians seldom lie. I mean, the direct lie can be a career killer. They evade, they dissemble, or they avoid talking. Thatcher's first election manifesto didn't mention privatisation. Very rare they directly lie. I I mean, some to say, we will not abolish the EMA, and then they do. To say a week before polling day, if ministers bring me cuts in frontline services, they'll be sent away. I, I mean, I think a lot of the disillusion now is a combination of Blair, Cameron has a lot of Blair's qualities. Looks very personable. I mean, he reaches out beyond the party base. Um, but he's obsessed with style and image. And, you know, I, I have no time for him at all. Parliament. But polling shows he's more popular than his party by some well, distance. And, again and it and again. did with Blair. I, Blair, after two years, was I mean, incredibly popular. Mm. I, but, you know, give it a few more years. Okay, we have lots of things a few more years. Right, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, I've got your gentleman here, and there. And then you have to wave a lot at the woman at the back, yeah. Yep, you. Uh, apart from corruption, incompetence, and racism, what would you think are the major issues the mayor has to tackle in relation to the Metropolitan Police? Uh, well, the, the mayor now has, I mean, my problem was that the only power I had as mayor was to set the budget. So everything had to be negotiated around the budget. So I'd sit there with Stevens and then Blair, and I'd say, you know, I'm giving you extra money to do this, and we want broadly to go in that direction. The weakness wasn't, I mean, Stevens and Blair both broadly supported that agenda. You've got to drive racism out the force. You've got to be more attentive to, to women's issues and so on. And the biggest single factor in the fall in the murder rate is we made police start taking seriously men assaulting their, their wives or girlfriends. Because very often that tends to lead on, I mean, that's where you find the people that will eventually go on to murder them and things like that. Um, but the, the real problem is you've got 50,000 people and it's very difficult for the commissioner of police, however good they are, to get a control of that bureaucracy. I really look forward to discovering uh, who it was in that command structure lied about the phone hacking thing. Uh, was it, you know, did Yates know about the scale of it but not tell the commissioner? Or did someone under Yates know about the scale and not tell them? And I think there, that is part of the problem with the Metropolitan Police. It's, I mean, very few bureaucracies that big directly lie managed by one person. And Whereas Stevens was lucky, he came in just as all the assistant and deputy commissioners were off and could bring in a team that was his. Ian Blair inherited some people that, you know, really I'd have liked to be able to get rid of. Boris does now have some real powers over the policing. I, and I mean, I'm optimistic that Hogan Howe will deliver. I mean, certainly, the, the mistake I think Boris made was in driving out Ian Blair. I which is what the Telegraph and the Mail wanted him to do. But then going in, in Paul Stevenson, they went for the candidate most likely to sort of broadly do what they wanted. And that isn't what you want in politics. You want someone who will tell you exactly what they think needs to be done. Once you've taken a decision, you expect them to carry it out. You don't want someone who's just telling you what you want here. That's fatal. Thanks. 
Do you think that the British policing model, though, needs reform? Because, mm. I mean, there you were, as mayor, one of the most powerful elected politicians in the United Kingdom. But formally, the police commissioner makes all operational yeah, yeah. police decisions. Now, we may not want the mayor making data... We don't want... Nobody wants the mayor saying, well, pursue them, don't pursue them. But the lack of yeah. you know, political credibility and legitimacy behind policing decisions is surely out of time. Well... I agree with you. I think the mayor should have much more say. <laughs> Boris's problem now, though, is if he was to fall out with Hogan Howe, he can't afford to lose a third commissioner. <laughs> hey, you can really only get rid of one. Hey, it's a Lady that... Bracknell principle. Yes, though, yeah, basically. Yeah. It'll be yeah. fatal. Three, three would definitely be careless. Isn't it? <laughs> right, there. Uh, Hello. Yes, you've got the um... microphone. And then there's a woman at the back who's been waiting patiently. So here, here, and then there. Okay, yeah. Hi. Uh, could I take you back to the beginning, uh, just before the Iraq war? Mm. Did you have any contact with uh, uh, higher politicians, Blair and Brown, and did you speak about it? Um, let me think. The, I, I, Brown refused to meet me until he became Prime Minister. I mean, it seems bizarre. We occasionally pass in a corridor and there'd be pleasantries, but you have been very rude about him in print. So you've been rude about me too. Oh, I yes, mean, I know, but it just explains why you might yeah. have only had that kind of relationship. He always used Ed Balls. I mean, the negotiations over Crossrail were me and Ed Balls and all of that. I got on well with Ed Balls, but Tony Blair asked to see me. I mean, I we had phone conversations after, the day after I won, and I got him to agree that Labour people could serve in the administration. They were quite good. Brown gave me a good budget in that first year. We didn't think so at the time, but it ended up being you know, more than we could actually spend. Um, and Blair was sounding me out to bring me back, but they assumed the congestion charge would fail, so they put it off. And it was really only after the, the war, um, in the July following the war, that he decided to bring me back. From then on, very regular meetings. And it's quite interesting because he wanted to bring me back, but he had to take a long time to overcome Prescott and Brown's opposition. And when we got to that point where George Bush came to London and we had a big rally in Trafalgar Square with an effigy of Bush being toppled, like Saddam's effigy had been toppled, I, I, Sally Morgan, who was you know, the go-between between, between me and Blair, phoned me about something that weekend. I said, I assume after all we've done about Bush... There's no question my coming back in. And she just laughs, oh, we don't care about that. I mean, you can win. And that's what they wanted. Um, we never talked about the war. We just didn't agree. We focused on the things where we did agree. Right, thank you. And uh, the back there, yep. That's it. You. Yeah, yeah. Hi, I'm Anna Savage, a writer. <laughs> I just wanted to know what you think of the current Labour government. There doesn't seem to be any viable opposition um, especially the cuts to disabled people and all the selling off of our services and what you think about that and is there anyone that could stand against the current government well, to rescue this country? Labour underpowered, is it? Yes, I, I don't agree. I, for the first time, uh, have a, a, a Labour leader that I'm completely confident of transforming Britain. And I think the parallels you need to look for uh, are with Thatcher. Thatcher didn't care what people thought about her. She had an agenda and she was determined to drive it forward. In all my meetings with Ed Miliband, I'd, although I worked with David Miliband, I'd not really had any dealings with Ed Miliband until he became leader the day after I was selected against Doona for the Merrill Post. So I had two years working with him very closely. And I tell you the classic thing. I mean, Blair and Brown never said no to my face. If they didn't agree, it's all, we'll get back to you and you never heard anything. Ed Miliband will tell you immediately he thinks you're wrong about this or whatever. And also when you're talking to Miliband, he's talking about where we should be 20 years ahead. And I think we're at a turning point in the sense that the Roosevelt and Ackley administrations laid the foundation for that post-war consensus around a welfare state and redistributive taxation. And then Thatcher and Reagan set a consensus which eventually Clinton and Blair broadly carried on with. I think we're at one of those two. Like, that neoliberal thing has imploded. The world, I mean, the IMF last month had a statement in which they said inequalities of wealth worsen the economic cycle. Oh, my God, they've been pursuing 
at neoliberal economics for a long time. So I think the world's looking for another way forward, and I think Ed Miliband um, has that. And therefore, I think for the first time in my lifetime, we've got late, the prospect of a Labour government that will be transformatory in the way that Thatcher's was. But, but surely, I mean, to, to take the logic of the question, I, surely it's a striking that given the abject failure, as some would see it, mm. of the neoliberal experiment and the failure of the banking system, surely what's remarkable, and not only in Britain, mm. is the failure of politicians on the left to come up with a consistent and coherent alternative that anybody can go with. Mm. And that would apply to Ed Miliband as much as to any other European left, it, left or centre leader. The, he's actually moving in the right direction, and I think they'll flesh out the strategy. In actual fact, a, a Labour government coming to power tomorrow would be in an amazing position. You have got a decade of pent-up demand in the economy. And if you made that shift, so you suddenly started to get growth, the deficit comes down. You could lock yourself in to perhaps 3% growth within that first 12 months. The biggest single issue is house building. No other infrastructure project can get underway in under years. We've got nearly 2 million families on waiting lists in this country. We have planning application, planning permissions all over Britain. No one's doing anything with because the, the developers just like sitting on a large land bank. An incoming Labour government would, should say to the Bank of England, no more quantitative easing. If you want to print money, print the money we'll use to start building another 150,000 homes a year. That would create work for over a million people. They spend it all in shops. A, couple that with an increase in the minimum wage to living wage level. Putting money into the hands of the poorest and the unemployed, they spend it. It generates growth. But you have to need the confidence to actually go down that road. Okay. Um, now, somebody here, I guess, there. Uh, can you, oh, actually, the gentleman in the, the light green, yes, you first and then here. Sorry, I'm, I will get to you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Alvin Carpio from the London School of Economics, a master's student here. I um, just wanted to know what you'd uh, say are your three uh, most proudest achievements in your 50-year career, um, as well as um, whether or not you think politics is really the place where you can create change, not only in a country in Britain or in a city, but around the world. I think there's so much to choose from. <laughs> <laughs> Just go for three. The gentleman asked for it's three. three. Saying in 1981, as the IRA was killing Londoners with bombs, we have to negotiate with the IRA. The only tragedy is we had to wait a decade before, over a decade, well over a decade before, a government started to do that. Another thousand people died. All those issues that were considered unacceptable on race and sexuality. Um, but I'm really quite proud of the buses, I use them every day. Uh, and you transform the bus service in this city. And, I mean, for me, climate change is going to be much... I, I fear climate change is much worse than people anticipate much quicker. And therefore, I think there is a very real prospect of civilizations, as we understand it, not surviving beyond the end of this century. I, nobody knows how quickly the feedback loops will work because in the past, when the world's gone through... You know, six degrees of global warming. It's been over hundreds of thousands of years, not in 200. And I'm very scared about that. And so you know, the fact that we raise those things, those issues... We, we came up with a plan, which Boris has broadly ignored, but hasn't scrapped, um, to reduce London's carbon emissions by 60% in 20 years. Any city can do that. And I, I suppose what I'm proud of is... Usually, the things I'm most roundly denounced for, with the passage of a decade or two, everyone says, oh, well, he was right about that. I just wish the buggers had done it at the time. And about the use of po um, politics as the right medium for delivering things? Is that what you... Well, it depends what you mean. I mean, if you mean democracy, I, well, progress is being made in China. No one gets a vote. I, and perhaps one of the weaknesses of our democratic system is the short-termism. What is a real pleasure when you're talking to leaders of the Chinese Communist Party is they're all talking in terms of 20, 30 years ahead. They all see themselves as part of a long project. When you talk to politicians in Britain or America, it's all 
I mean, no one's focused beyond the next election. I mean, often they're not focused beyond next week's opinion poll. And it's that short term. Now, I don't think that's inevitably a byproduct of the democratic system. I think it's a byproduct of the cowardice of politicians who are so terrified of losing, they wait until there's a consensus. Who, who was it said? Was it Talleyrand said, there go my people, I see where they're going so I can lead them? Nothing's changed. Yeah. Gentlemen here. And again, we've got five or six, five minutes left, so we need to get short questions and short answers here, right at the back. So one, two, three. But do them quickly, yeah? Okay. Um, just wanted to follow up your comments on the position of London Mayor, specifically um, to ask this. After, after booting out Ian Blair and mm. overturning the veto of the London Fire Authority uh, mm. for his budget and putting people like Andrew Gilligan in place, mm. has Boris gone a bit power mad? No, I mean, I think what's interesting when you're with Boris at times where you realise he wants to be liked. I mean, there was a point during the last election when there was all the, I was saying your tax affairs are exactly the same as mine and I was being denounced. And he, after about a week of this, before we about to go on time to debate, he wanders in to the room I was in and said, and said are, we, are we all right on this tax thing? And there was a sort of, you know, I mean, it's like a virgin approaching her husband on the first night. It was off-putting, you know. He wanted my approval. And I told him, no, piss off. And <laughs> I think that's a fatal weakness in Boris. He wants to be liked. If I'd wanted to be liked, I'd never have achieved a tenth of what I achieved. Now, in politics, if you're coming, if you want to be popular, go into music or the arts. Do not come into bloody politics. You have to take difficult decisions, even when you're right. They're going to offend vast numbers of people. Right, uh, and then here. Uh, so last October I read your memoirs, mm. and uh, one thing that struck me as very interesting is when you were in New York and visited the uh, um, Crisis Response yeah. Center, and you, you said in your memoirs uh, that they're preparing for a major hurricane that will strike the Northeast. And, I was thinking at the time, oh, and that'd be interesting. A week later, Hurricane Sandy happened in the Northeast, hit New York. Um, I thought that was absolutely uh, uh, prophetic that that happened to be in, in your memoirs. Uh, so what I'm asking, though, is, is do you think that we're in an age now where the role of cities in global warming and climate change is more to respond and manage to these crises, or do you think there's still room to prevent and prepare against the worst of global warming? Well... The Guardian did a survey of 250 climate change scientists in the run-up to the Copenhagen conference. Only one believed it was possible to keep the rise to 2 degrees Celsius. The other split between 3 and 4 and 5. 5 is catastrophic. That is a possible collapse of our civilization. But it's achievable. I mean, the plan we came up with, this 60% cut in London uh, in 20 years, could be done in every city. It's about generating energy locally because two-thirds of our energy is wasted because it's generated miles from where you use it. It's insulating properly. None of it you know, requires new scientific breakthroughs. Um, but the striking thing is Bloomberg got it right. I mean, Bloomberg a, had, by 2007, in place the absolute state-of-the-art centre which would manage the hurricanes because as the North Atlantic temperature rises, they're going to go... They've never had more than force two. They're going to get force three and force four. And they have to move two million New Yorkers to shelters because they're going to be inundated by the sea. And I suppose, in a sense, governments, unless you're in America or China or India or Brazil, just about, governments can do a lot at that size. I mean, European governments, too small to have an impact on world politics too large to successfully manage most of their own um, country. The, the best is Germany because 50% of spending is devolved to local and, and regions. Here, everything's run from the centre and it, it's disastrous. I, I suppose if it was up to me, I'd say you want a United States of Europe with about 100 virtually self-governing city-states, just about small enough for individuals to manage them and keep tabs on it. I've watched succession of Labour and Tory, Secretaries of State for Health, all fail to come to grips with the NHS. And how could you? How can you run from Whitehall? This vast bureaucracy, it's just not possible. You've got to devolve it down so it's manageable. 
Well, there's a, mon- a model to be studied by somebody, uh, a United, Na- United Europe single country with city-states as a sub- sub-national tier. That's mm. some, well worth e- exemplifying for somebody at the back there. Do you think the Greater London Council should be brought back rather than London being governed by two mayors and 30 London boroughs? And what about the provincial municipal councils? Well, I, the, the 32 London boroughs, I think, are no longer the right size for what they do. I, I, I think you want, you want is something like the neighbourhood council, which oversees the local school, where ordinary people can just turn up one evening a month and have a say in what's happening in their local parks, whether or not they can have a parking scheme, and all those local things that really matter to people. But then I'd have five London boroughs wedges, a, that, you know, about a million and a half each. They manage everything. They administer employment benefit. They run the universities in their area. They run most of the local policing. And then a, a proper council dealing with the genuine strategic regional things. I think all of our structures are wrong. When the London boroughs were set up, they were seen as breathtakingly large and running so much. And so much that they used to do has been taken away. Um, but I don't think anyone's really got the stomach for that sort of radical change, sadly. I, so I like the German system, the Lander, and the fact that 50% of state spending is at local level. OK, we've got about two minutes left, Ken. Um, you're still very much involved in contemporary politics. Looking ahead, I'm not going to ask you what you're going to do next, but what is it you would like to achieve using politics in the years that lie ahead? Well, I suppose my Saturday morning radio programme with David Mellor is a chance to educate, um, to you know, get ideas across to people. Um, in a sense... My generation has had its time. If you actually look, what did that post-war generation offer? Uh, Having been given so much, the best quality of life in human history, what did we offer our countries in terms of leadership? It was um, Bill Clinton and George Bush, John Major, Tony Blair and Gordon Brown. And I'm afraid the world has moved on to people young enough to be our kids. And... I'm going to carry on arguing, promoting ideas, but I mean, another generation is going to have to take them up, and sadly. So I'll, I'll continue to be part of the debate. Uh, but I, I, I don't, I'm not waiting for a call for Cameron to say, can you come and assist us with something? You know? <laughs> no, no temptation to the House of Lords? Oh. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Look, Wait, they want you. I, the, the only trouble is, I've had to sit through debates in the House of Lords and the answer to a different question. The, I mean, pace of, the pace of debate is so painfully slow. You know. Did you not once describe them as vandals in ermine? Was that somebody no, that was the law lords. That was the law lords, yeah, so yeah. a different kind of laws. House anyway. lords are too slow to do any vandalism. Right. <laughs> a great <clears throat> hour, and three, hour and a quarter. Um, thank you very much, Ken, for coming along and sharing your... Uh, thoughts about about your history, politics, your own uh, background and so on. Uh, The book, I believe, is outside to be purchased. And uh, one final thing, in in this series, uh, we've got next week, British government coming to talk on Tuesday evening, I think, Tuesday evening, uh, Shirley Williams, Baroness Shirley Williams, in a similar format. So please, any of you who'd like to, come along to that. But for now... Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to uh, thank Ken Livingston.